there once lived an emperor whose vanity knew no bounds. A man of royal blood, he was bathed in the opulence of his kingdom and the adoration of his subjects. Yet his appetite for admiration was insatiable, his love for grandeur, inexhaustible. His heart beat not for the welfare of his people, but for the shimmering glamour of new clothes, each more extravagant than the last. This emperor, with a wardrobe as vast as his kingdom, was a slave to his own vanity. His day began with the selection of his attire, a task that consumed hours of his precious time. The sight of his reflection in the mirror, draped in silks and velvets, studded with diamonds and rubies, was his greatest delight. His subjects, who should have been his first priority, were merely spectators in this grand spectacle of his self-indulgence. His kingdom was a stage, and he the prime actor, with every day a new performance. His subjects marveled at his sartorial elegance, as he paraded through the streets in his latest ensemble. His love for clothes was not merely a preference, but an obsession. The more praise he received, the more his vanity swelled, eclipsing his responsibilities as a ruler. A life of such lavishness, however, was not without its perils. His obsession with his appearance, his constant need for approval, made him vulnerable to manipulation. His subjects, who should have been his allies, became spectators to his vanity, watching as he squandered his time and resources on his unending quest for sartorial perfection. In the midst of this spectacle, two cunning swindlers watched from the shadows, their eyes gleaming with opportunity. They saw in the Emperor's vanity not a man of power, but a puppet, whose strings they could pull to their advantage. And so they devised a plan, a plan that would exploit the Emperor's vanity for their own benefit. In his kingdom, two swindlers saw an opportunity to exploit the Emperor's vanity for their benefit. Opening. The cunning swindlers came up with an irresistible proposition for the Emperor. Under the shadow of the Emperor's vanity, the swindlers hatched a plan. They promised to weave a fabric so extraordinary that it would be invisible to those unfit for their positions or simply too stupid to see its beauty. It was a proposition designed to appeal to the Emperor's ego, and it did so brilliantly. Imagine the audacity of these swindlers. They claimed to possess a skill so unique, so magical, that it could separate the worthy from the unworthy. The fabric, they said, was not simply a material, but a mirror reflecting the intelligence and competence of those who beheld it. Their act was nothing short of convincing. They spoke with such conviction, such certainty, that the emperor, and indeed the entire court, were swept up in their grand narrative. They painted pictures with their words, describing the fabric's ethereal beauty, its shimmering colors that changed with the light, its texture softer than a spider's web. And the emperor, Oh, the Emperor. He was fascinated by the idea. A fabric that could reveal the unworthy? It was more than he could resist. He imagined himself draped in this magical fabric, walking among his subjects, discerning the wise from the foolish, the competent from the inept. It was a tantalizing vision. He saw not the deceit in the swindler's eyes, but the promise of a garment that would confirm his superiority, his vanity, his desire to be seen as the most intelligent, the most worthy, blinded him to the swindle unfolding before him. Closing, the emperor, blinded by his vanity, gave the swindlers a bag of gold coins to start their work. His trust, his gold, his ego, all handed over to the swindlers. Little did he know, he was setting the stage for the greatest charade his kingdom had ever seen. The swindlers began their charade, pretending to work on the invisible fabric, a spectacle of deceit where two con artists with their nimble fingers mimic the motions of weaving and sewing, threading nothing into the air. Their hands danced in empty space, crafting a phantom tapestry that existed only in the minds of the beholders. Their ruse was as intricate as the supposed fabric they were creating. Each gesture, each furrowed brow of concentration, each satisfied nod at the invisible progress, was part of a meticulously crafted performance. They were not merely swindlers, they had become actors on the grand stage of the Emperor's court, playing their roles with unnerving conviction. Meanwhile, the Emperor, driven by his vanity and curiosity, would often send his ministers to check on the progress of his new clothes. Each visit was a test, a trial of their honesty, or rather their ability to lie convincingly. For the ministers, the invisible fabric was a phantom they were forced to see, a lie they were compelled to believe. 
the fear of appearing incompetent or unfit for their positions forced the ministers to play along with the swindler's charade. They praised the non-existent fabric, marvelling at its non-existent patterns and colours. They returned to the emperor with tales of a magnificent fabric, woven with threads of sunlight and moonlight, as ethereal as the morning mist, and as splendid as the evening sunset. This was a kingdom of pretension, where truth was the first casualty of vanity. Everyone from the emperor to his ministers, from the courtiers to the servants, they all played their parts in this grand deception. They all pretended to see the invisible fabric, to admire its non-existent beauty. Not a single soul dared to admit the truth, not a single voice dared to shatter the illusion. Everyone in the kingdom played along not daring to admit that they couldn't see anything. A collective denial, a shared lie, a kingdom blinded by its own vanity. And so the tale of the invisible fabric continued, weaving itself into the fabric of their lives, their history, their legacy. Finally the day arrived when the swindlers presented the emperor's new clothes. The garments, invisible as they were, were held aloft with great care by the fraudsters, their fingers miming the handling of delicate fabric. A masterful performance of reverence and awe, which was mirrored on the emperor's face. He marveled at the exquisite nothingness, admiring the non-existent embroidery, the intricate detail that simply wasn't there. The swindlers persuaded him to shed his royal attire, helping him don the invisible suit with pomp and ceremony. The emperor, blinded by his own vanity, reveled in the illusion. He admired himself in the mirror, twirling and posing, basking in the glory of his new clothes. Then came the grand parade. The emperor strutted down the city streets, a spectacle of bare skin and bloated pride, while his subjects watched in stunned silence. It was a sight to behold, an emperor parading in his birthday suit, convinced he was cloaked in the finest attire ever crafted. The kingdom held its breath, a collective gasp caught in the throat of every man, woman and child. They saw the naked truth, yet none dared to speak it. Fear silenced them. The fear of appearing unfit for their positions, of being labelled stupid or incompetent. So, they applauded, they cheered, they praised the invisible clothes, joining in the Emperor's grand delusion. They played along, trapped in a web of pretense and deceit, their honesty buried under the weight of societal expectations and fear of judgment. The Emperor, basking in the adulation, was oblivious to his exposure. His vanity had stripped him bare, leaving him naked not just in body but in spirit too. He was a prisoner of his own pride, his ego overriding his sense of reason and reality. The entire kingdom watched in disbelief and fear, except for one. The Emperor continued his parade, oblivious to the silent cries of truth echoing in the hearts of his subjects. The kingdom had become a stage for the farcical display of vanity and deceit, a silent witness to the naked truth. Amidst the silent spectators, a child's voice rang out clear and truthful. An innocent giggle echoed through the crowd, piercing the air with its unfiltered honesty. But the Emperor has nothing on at all, cried the child, pointing a small, chubby finger towards the parade. The spectators froze, the words hanging in the air like a fragile glass about to shatter. A ripple of whispers began to spread, a wave of realisation that washed over the crowd. The child's words had sparked something within them, a flame of truth that could no longer be ignored. People began to murmur in agreement, their voices growing louder and more confident. He's right, the Emperor is naked, they cried, their laughter echoing through the square. The child, with his pure heart and unclouded vision, had seen what the adults, blinded by their fear and vanity, could not. The emperor shivered, for he knew that the child spoke the truth. The emperor's new clothes is not just a tale of vanity and deceit. It's a profound reflection on the human condition, a parable that speaks to the heart, urging us to be honest, to be courageous, and to challenge the status quo. The story is a stark reminder of the dangers of vanity, of being so consumed by a self-created illusion that we lose sight of reality. It warns us of the deceitful nature of those who exploit such vanity for their own gain, leaving us exposed, vulnerable and a spectacle of ridicule. But most importantly, it champions the virtue of honesty. It celebrates the courage to speak the truth even when it goes against popular belief. 
even when it comes from the most unexpected sources. It reminds us that truth, however uncomfortable or inconvenient, is always preferable to a comforting lie. In the end, it's the innocent voice of truth that echoes the loudest, long after the pretentious chatter fades away.